students will say, you know, I want to break into a scene. And I said, you never break into a scene. You're invited in. Being a musician and, and being a professional musician is 1% luck and 99% preparation. Your career is never going to end up how you thought it was going to. I've never met anybody say, you know, I did this, this, and this, and that's what happened. Trust, man. Trust is crucial in life. And trust comes from love, right? Welcome to another episode of Contrabass Conversations, your show covering life on the low end of the spectrum. I'm your host, Jason Heath. I'm so excited to bring you today's episode featuring Derek Jones. And Derek is the bassist for Cirque du Soleil's show, Ka, in Las Vegas. He's been playing with Cirque for over 12 years now. And prior to that, he played with Chris Thiele and Nickel Creek, with Jerry Douglas, so many other great musicians. And at this point, with Cirque, he's performed over 5,200 performances of Ka. We dig into what it's like playing for the show. We start off by talking about gear. Derek and I were chatting over Skype, and I was seeing all this amazing electric gear, acoustic gear. So we talk about what he uses, what he likes, discovering his eminence bass, which is the bass that he's using for Cirque right now, the band set up for Cirque. It's actually four stories below ground level. He's playing fretted, fretless, and upright with a lot of bow work on the show, actually. So after that, we move into what might be my favorite audition story of all time. If I ever do a highlight episode of audition stories, this will almost certainly be number one. It starts about 35 minutes into the episode. And definitely check that out. It's a great story of putting yourself out there, taking a chance, dealing with the unexpected. So great. Solid gold for sure. And before we dive into today's interview, I'd like to thank Dario Strings, and I'd love it if you entered our giveaway with them. ContourRaceConversations.com slash strings will take you there, and we are giving away with Dario 10 sets of Kaplan strings, which is what I'm using on my bass right now. I was just playing with the Modesto Symphony with them, and they work great in the section. They've got this rich tonal color. They're beautifully balanced. They work great under the bow. They're used by artists like Daniel Kimbrough, David Allen Moore, Gabriele Raggiante. These are all past podcast guests, by the way. You can find them at the Diderio website. Definitely check them out. I'm loving them. And I'd also like to thank the Bass Violin Shop, which is the Southeast's largest inventory of basses. They offer the largest number of laminate, hybrid, and carved double basses. So whether you're in search of the best entry-level laminate or a fine pedigree instrument, there's always going to be something available for you to try. Check them out at BassViolinShop.com. Now, you're going to hear a couple of excerpts from Derek's album, Run With Me. We're going to start off with a little selection from You Still Believe In Me, and we'll finish off after the interview with The Nearness of You. Links to everything are in the show notes. I know you're going to enjoy this conversation with Derek Jones. Derek. Jason, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing, man? I'm great. Good to hear from you, man. Yeah. This will be fun. Oh, is that a, a Carvin? What is what is? No, the... this this is a uh, Tobias, Michael Tobias Designs. It's the new, uh, it's called the Super 5. Okay, cool. And it's really an interesting design because Michael kind of found the sweet spot for these two pickups. You'd usually see them, I guess, a little farther apart from each other, but he kind of put them right together. And the different sounds that you can get between the three band EQ and then the uh, parallel single coil series, <laughs> three different ways of wired the pickups that you can get. And you have separate separate uh, switches for each pickup. The combination of sounds you can get between the balancing and everything is really fascinating. And I, I, I loved it. I have a four string version of it, too, that I actually tuned ADGC just for fun because I've got all these different bases and. I'm hoping for a fretless to come out soon because I told him, I said, hey, if you, you guys got to have a fretless. Said, well, they're, they're planning on coming out with a six string version of it, which for me is a little wide. I, I've had six strings in the past, but um, I don't know. I, I really like the five and four. So uh, I'm waiting for the uh, the fretless, hopefully this year, maybe. I'm not sure. But I have a I have a bunch of these 
different ones that they make and um Really fun, really interesting company. I mean, Mike, these are these are actually his um, his overseas made bases. So they're not the American made ones. They're made in China uh, at a factory that he oversees, and him and his son do all the setups and everything. And um, my friends in um, in Southern California, uh, Dana and Katie Teague of Dana Be Goods, they distribute the bases. So I've known them for years, and they were like, "Hey, you want to try these new ones?" And I was like, "Okay." And um, yeah, I've really been impressed. I've been like, wow, these are great, you know, and they have other models that they have six string and five and fours of. And, uh, I, you know, maybe I just haven't found the six string that, you know, really great. But I found my, my hands are massive and long. So I like the chordal aspects of it. But uh, I kind of went back to the five. And, and this that's a 35 inch scale length. And then they make, you know, this is the 34 inch Saratoga that they make, which is more of a jazz bass kind of style. This is wonderful as well. This is my first bass I got, and uh, I have a fretless version of this, and I have a four-string fretted and fretless version of oh, this wow. as well <laughs> for different things. <laughs> and then, um, and they make some other ones too. But but they're, they're really uh, for the price. I mean, um, you know, they're they're wonderful. They're really great. So. Yeah, that's awesome. So, and, and like on the upright side of things, do you plan one bass mainly, or what do you do in terms of gear for the upright? Uh, well, I have this one. This is a, a, a company, a friend of mine's family in China, in Shanghai. It's called a Chen. Mm-hmm. Uh, his name is Yan Bing Chen. And he opened up a store um, called Desert Strings here in Las Vegas. He has a store in Cleveland called Cleveland Strings. And his family make all the violin uh, family of instruments. And, I, and the cellos now are, what he's been telling me, are winning awards in the, in the luthier competitions and a lot of great players in China and New York are playing them now. And he wanted the basses to kind of start coming up to that playability. And I kind of walked into his store last uh, December, maybe, or end of November, just because I was curious. Hey, there's a store 10 minutes from my house. You know, wow. You know, I never, ever thought I would buy an upright bass in Las Vegas. You know, right. Las Vegas is such a challenge for upright bass with the with the humidity. I mean, what the other day it was 7 percent humidity. <laughs> Yeah, it's just wow. like, you know, so you're always, you know, I, I went, you know, I've been to different places like Lemur Music or I've been to Lisa Gass's place and beautiful instruments. But I'm always afraid as soon as I take them out of L.A. and bring them up here, what's going to happen to them? So I walked in and met Yan Bing and, and he said, well, hey, I have a bass in the back. Let me set it up for give me a couple of days and come back and check it out. And this was that bass. And. I played it and I was like, wow, man, this is a, this is really great. You know? So I, I purchased it and, and, um, it's been really good. I actually had Gary Carr play it cause Gary lives here. Him and Harmon live here uh, half a half of the year now. And I, I got to meet him at just a fluke. My friend said, Hey, Gary Carr's performing at the Flamingo library. I was like, what? What? <laughs> <laughs> you know, what? And, and it's a free concert. I was like, wait, you gotta be kidding me. And there's a, a wonderful, um, youth uh, program in Las Vegas to get young people to play string instruments. Uh, Hal Weller started the program. I, I can't think of the name of it right now, but Hal and, and Gary are really good friends. And, and um, it's a great story. So I said, man, we have to go. It's like, so we drive down to Flamingo library and, and all these libraries in Las Vegas are really interesting. They have these beautiful performance halls that are just really great and you wouldn't even know it and then you'd walk into this one room and all of a sudden it leads down a hallway and then there's this really like you know 500 seat theater or something like that and they're very underutilized um but anyway uh this was when the bernstein letters came out or bernstein the, the book leonard bernstein's all his letters they had this at the smithsonian they made it his dog made it into a book and you know gary and that family were really close and so his daughter was here talking about the book and doing a lecture on it for all anybody who wanted to come so we got there and um, all of a sudden here's Gary and Harmon walk out. And I kind of sit there in the audience. I look at my friend John Coleman. And I go, I can't believe this is happening, man. Because I haven't, I, you know, I know he wasn't performing as much anymore. And I never got a chance to see him play. And, and uh, then he starts playing. I'm like, wow. And then they show a video of him playing on the radio show that Leonard Bernstein had in the 50s or late 40s. You know, he was 18 and they showed the video of him playing this P the Swan, I think, or something like that. And, uh, you know, I'm just sitting there going, I can't believe this, man. This is so wonderful. And then they sat down and talked about the book and, and his life with the family and anecdotes about their lives and stuff. And it was just like sitting like a fly on the wall. Right. You know, it's really cool. And then when they're done, you know, we come out and the, the everybody's in line to meet him. 
And I said, man, we got to get in line. Got to, got to, just got to say, I can't believe it, you know? So we get in line and, and line comes up and then Hal Weller walks up and he's a friend of my friend, John. And John introduces me and says, Derek's the bass player on the Cirque du Soleil show Ka. And Hal goes, oh my gosh, we all went to see the show last night. <laughs> Gary and Harmon and Mrs. Bernstein, all of us went. And he goes, I have to meet introduce you. So he just takes me out of line and we walk up to Gary. And, you know, it's just like, wow, you know. And Gary's like, oh, we loved the show. I loved every, oh, it's such a beautiful show. And then we started talking and talking. And then he goes, we were talking about his bass. He had the travel one that he had with him. And he goes, you want to check out the bass? And I went, are you kidding me? <laughs> so, so we all went back sta- back on the stage. And, and another gentleman was there with a, one, one, some of his students. And Gary just hands me his bass. And I just started playing. I start sticking there. I can't believe this is happening. And then we just kind of became friends and kept in touch. And I go over and, and hang out with him. So when I got this bass, Jan Bing said, well, man, it would be an honor to have him play a couple of the basses and see what he thought. And he loved them. So, um, and he doesn't travel with a bass anymore. Even his travel bass, he showed me on a, on, on a trip to Japan like a year ago. They had broke the fingerboard right off of it, you know, and they had glued it back on just before the performance. Like they, 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 all these guys came out in like in Japan and glued it back and everything. And 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 it was it was. But he said I, after that, I won't I won't travel with a bass, you know. And now he's getting ready to do the the commencement speech at the 50th anniversary of. Uh, ISB and that's really fantastic. So well, and how how cool that he lives there. I had no idea that he and Harmon were living there half the year. <laughs> Mom lived here. She left them a house, and then they um, set up residence in Summerlin on the west side of the valley. And uh, yeah, it's just like a random kind of thing where he said, "Oh, we live here." I was like, "What?" You know. And so he invited me over to the house, and we hung out for about four hours just talking, and it was it was great, you know. And but I, I, the bass was really great, and and um, the Chen Bei, Chen instruments, uh, they're a family of instrument makers in Shanghai. And I, you know, like I said, I never thought I'd buy a, a bass here in Las Vegas. And since it was, it hadn't been here too long, I'm not sure how long it, it had been seasoning here, but, um, I just, you know, I keep, I have a humidifier here in the room and, you know, you just kind of, you know, try to keep it up as much as you can. I, I don't put the dampets in the bass like I used to, um, but yeah, so I, I have that. And then I have an eminence base, which is uh, my friend Gary Bartig helped come up with that and design it. And he um, uh, I met him when I was living in Nashville back in 2001. Actually, I played the I played the bass for the first time in Colorado at a festival when I was playing with the Mike Marshall, Daryl Anger band. And this is before I moved to Nashville, I believe. And I, my friend Byron House was another wonderful bassist out of Nashville. And a dear friend, he 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 had one. So we were backstage kind of jamming, but it's a small box. You can't really hear it. You know, it's not made to play it acoustically. It's made to fit the golf club case when you take it apart. And it sounds great when you plug it in. So uh, maybe a year or two later, I had moved. We had moved to Nashville and I was I got this gig with this band, Nickel Creek. So I needed something to travel with. And uh, I, I checked out a bunch of different companies, you know, through, uh, through the NAMM show in Nashville. And I, I met, you know, uh, just like maybe the top 10 or five or eight, whatever upright EUBs that are out there. And um, they were all wonderful instruments. But when you put a bow to them, they just sounded electric. You know, it was kind of like, OK, that's, that's as far as it can go with that sound. And then uh, I heard a live recording that Nickel Creek had given me when I started studying the music. And Byron was playing bass and I called him up and I said, Hey man, is that your, your big bass that you brought on the road? He says, no, man, that's that eminence bass I told you about. And I called Gary up five minutes later and ordered one because <laughs> the, bow, the bow tone on it just freaked me out. I was like, that's the bow tone on that. Cause he was playing this beautiful bow solo. And I was like, wow, man, that is killing. So I just, I just bought it. And then I got it and set it up. You know, it's pretty easy. Once you get used to, you know, taking it apart and put it together, it's great for travel because no one charges you any oversize because everyone wants golf golfers to be traveling. They don't want to stop the golfers. So it's in a golf location. So they, Hey, you know, so it's, it, you know, I haven't been out there traveling. I mean, with, I've been on the show now 12 and a half years and, uh, I have been traveling like I used to, but this base, you know, that's actually the base I use on the show because when I got here, I'm in there. There's two studios. We're four stories below the stages. It's 13 story, 12 story theater. It's a massive thing. Seven stages that move. 
So we're four stories below ground level, if you will. <laughs> and and uh, there's uh, six musicians, uh, two keyboards, vocal, cello, accordionist, guitar player, another vocalist in one room, and then drums and bass in the other. And I play three basses on the show, fretted, fretless, and upright. And there's a lot of bowing, a lot of orchestra kind of type stuff. And I'm not, I'm not a classical player. I didn't study. I never played in an orchestra, really. But I, I, I got to hang out with Edgar Meyer, and I've got to meet guys, and I'd ask them questions. I'd ask everybody questions. Gary, I've been asking questions, you know. And just trying to feel it and, and study it. And, and, and I've had lessons from time to time, and it's been great. Um, but when I got here, they were really worried about how they were going to mic up my big bass because the drum set is two feet away. And it was like, okay, um, how do we do this? So they were going to build a wall inside the room. And then how do we get air conditioning to it? And there was all this kind of s discussion and kind of trying to figure it out. And so I said, hey, guys, I may have the perfect instrument to come in here and do this with. And the musical director was very reticent. He was like, oh, I hate those electric uprights. I, I don't, you know, and I said, well, try this, you know, let's try this. And, and the thing about um, pickups like piezo or piezo, however you say it, pickups, um, is that you have to load them with the correct homage. So what that means, and my, my dear friend, Rick Turner, who is kind of a genius with all this stuff, he started the Olympic Bass Corporation. He, but, you know, he's the guy that put an Olympic bass in Stanley Clark's hand and said, I built this, check it out. And then Stan, that's the legend, right? And, and he also built the wall of sound for the Grateful Dead and worked a lot. He's an electronics genius. And he taught me this because I was working, I, he was a friend of mine and, and uh, he built the, the pickups that Brian Bromberg used for a while. And so he was discussing that, you know, you really have to have between three and 10 mega ohm load on a piezo pickup to open up the frequency range. Because if you plug it into just a regular input of like a direct box or a, an amplifier, you're going to get your mid range frequencies and then your highs and your lows aren't going to be coming through the, through the pickup. So that's why a lot of people get, oh, it sounds so nasally, right? And you put a bow to it, it's even worse. It's like, oh, it's like it just accentuates all that. Well, what I learned, you know, I my my preamps I use, I'm a Fishman artist, so I use the Fishman Platinum Pro EQ, which is just fantastic. And it's a 10 mega ohm input load. So right away, you're already loaded. You're ready to go. Your low and high frequencies are now there. And then I, it has a beautiful EQ on it with a with a parametric mid-range. So you can kind of what I do is crank the mid-range until it's the most obscene frequency I can find. <laughs> you know, oh, that's, that's there's the one. And then I just cut that. And I've talked to many, many sound people about this. You're better off to cut frequencies than boost. So I leave everything else flat and I just cut the mid range that I don't need. And then when you go from pitch to bow, it's really, really even. And you get a really nice full sound. And also on that preamp, it has um, a compressor on it. So you can put a little bit of compressor. So when you go to the bow, it brings it down just a bit so you're not overloading anything. So I brought that into the studio and plugged that rig in and they went out and started checking in the house and they were like, oh, my God, you know, this is just great. You know, it just sounds and it was totally the thing. And since it's a small body, I mean, you're still going to get some sound of the drums because it's a it's it's designed, to, you know, it has a, a bass bar and a sound post in it. And it's it's pickup sound, but it's not going to resonate as as great as big as a larger body. So that's kind of was the comp the compromise. And then I actually had to use mine on a on a gig sometimes i get called out of town very rarely and so they ended up buying another one for the show because <laughs> i had to take mine and like, oh my god you know and they, they don't want to have somebody bring another bass and re-eq so i told them, i said you know you really should think about you know so i called gary up and said oh yeah i got one you know i got a, a set neck one because i'm not traveling with that one but that's pretty much when the fishman platinum pro eq came out i got when i think it was in 2001 or you know, I was working with Nickel Creek and that came out. I was using uh, an LR Bags direct box, which is also a fantastic device. Really wonderful. They make great products, too. And uh, but since I, I used the full circle uh, pickup on my bass, which I love. I think it just sounds really natural for a pickup uh, of all the ones. I mean, I, I started with an Underwood pickup back in the day and then I used a Fishman kind of preamp with some EQ to kind of get that happening. And then. Uh, went to a, a David Gage type pickup for a while, which is great too. It's a different sound, but but overall, the the uh, for me, 
the full circle is really great with the Tomastic Spiracore strings. I've gone back to those. I, I go away from them and then I come back and finally I said, I'm just going to go back to these. You know, I've been using them forever. And uh, yeah, so that's that's kind of my my setup. You know, the amps I use are I just, uh, you know, I just got this Mesa Boogie D1, D800 little it's like five pounds or th- and it's 800 watts. And I use AccuGroove speaker cabinets, which are just really flat sounding, beautiful cabinets. But um, I try to go trying to make this bass just sound louder is the challenge. You know, I don't want it to sound like the pickups getting louder. I really want to sound like the whole bass, you know. So it kind of you kind of listen, you know, you just kind of use your ear and listen and you can find those things like getting the mid range out of the way a little bit. Kind of just lets the lows and highs stay where they are and you're just taking out the frequency and instead of trying to cover it up with the other things just find the one that's nasty and then just cut it down a bit and yeah that's a great technique i mean i've done that like when i'm working in a daw or something with a certain thing i never thought yeah. about doing that on a bass uh, but it makes total sense like what's what's that for your it's probably different for everybody's instrument but like what's that band for you that's really obnoxious like, oh, wow i wish i i wish i was that good to, to know <laughs> the band. i mean i think it's around 250 okay I don't know, but I, I just know, I just know that if you're looking at the mid-range control and I get it to about one o'clock to two o'clock, and I have crank on that preamp, that's where it is, and then I go, okay, there it is, and it's pr- pretty much consistent. And then, um, yeah, and, and again, you just use your ears, you know, you listen, and 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 it's a challenge too because you don't want to take too much of it out because especially if you're playing in a situation where there's a drum set and there's cymbals and things like that stuff could get covered up too much. So you, you, you know, you're always kind of just listening, just keep listening and keep listening. You know, this, I can't say enough how much listening is required you know, as in everything else we do. If we, we can hear stuff, but if we don't listen to things then, and, and make those decisions, uh, but it takes time. It also helps to um, have your amplifier off of the ground somehow, because um, that resonates with the, with the stage as well. Depending on what stage you're on, it could be hollow, it could be something, it could be solid. All those things kind of mix with everything else that you're doing. So what I do is I carry um, this little this little pad. It's called the RLX Gamma, uh, but there's a couple of companies that make these things, and it's just a acoustical um, foam on top of a with a wood base on it, and you stick that on the stage, and then you're it decouples your speaker cabinet from the floor. So you're actually getting a flat response from the speaker cabinet now. You're, you're not being influenced by the vibrations and the resonant frequencies of the floor that you put your cabinet on. Because I found, man, that can really mess you up. You know, it's like, go one place, sounded great. Next place, oh, what happened? You know, also if you're in a corner, you know, that, that changes things too. But lifting it off the ground, even that little bit with the foam and just decoupling everything, gives you much more of a flat response and you can kind of hear exactly what you're supposed to hear instead of what you think you might be hearing with the walls vibrate, you know. We used to do it, I remember when I was playing in the Bay Area, because I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area, so I grew up there, which you're living at now. I yeah. hope you're having a great time. Love it. Um, <laughs> yeah, so all my, you know, I grew up playing there and I was really fortunate to to have the experience to play with uh, Orestes Velato in, in Los Quimbos 90, which was in the early 90s was like the salsa band. You know, and Orestes is like, he played with Kachow. You know, I mean, he played with Tipica 73. He played with, Von. I mean, he's a legend. I mean, he played with Santana. So I, I, I love this man to death. And he <laughs> took me under his wing when I didn't know anything about anything about Latin music, you know, and gave me a shot. And I played with him for two years. And uh, there was a club in Emeryville called Kimball's East. And um, I believe it's still there. Um, but be- down below there, they made another club and they made a salsa club. Well, the problem was the stages were kind of in the same area. So when the, sal- you know, like I, I remember uh, Mark Johnson was playing with Lyle May's trio upstairs and then the salsa band would play downstairs and it was just resonating the entire building, you know? And, and so they had, the first time I saw this was they had a, a massive foam box that they put the base cabinet on and they put that in there to kind of absorb that so it wasn't vibrating into the whole building um, and it sucked if you were used to the vibration of the bass you're like oh i don't hear anything i don't feel it now but you had to get used to it but it was the first time i saw that was working with those gimbals and seeing that and at first I, th- I didn't get it at all i thought it was like just sucking the tone out of 
out of my rig. And then I realized, no, you're actually hearing what your rig really sounds like. So if you don't like it, you got to do something about it. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, here's the truth. Accept it or don't. <laughs> so... <laughs> Wow. What, what, what prompted the move to Nashville for you? Was it starting to work with Nickel Creek or what, how did, how did that all work for you? No, I was, I was, uh, again, working with the band, Mike Marshall, Daryl Anger band. Mm, oh, right, right, right. Okay. We, we had met, I knew Daryl. I had never really met Mike and the drummer, Aaron Johnson, who is, is a dear friend of mine and one of the best drummers I've ever played with. He knew Mike and didn't know Daryl. And, and of course, Mike and Daryl have a legendary relationship, you know, with all the bands they played in. And all the music they've written, it's amazing. So we just kind of um, called up our friend Cookie Marenko, who is the producer of my album, called her up and said, hey, we, we, we all had kind of studio time that we had built up through her doing different things. And she was just like, well, come on in. So we came in, set up our gear and just started playing and recording everything, just making it up. Just, just, it was almost like we were like the get to know you day where we just, somebody would start playing and someone else, and we just played and we recorded like, you know, an, you know, maybe an hour or maybe half hour worth of stuff, you know, I don't know. And it was just like, we thought, well, this is really an intro. Whoa, this, this came out of this. Wow. This is really cool. And then um, maybe a month later, uh, Mike sent it over to Gary West at compass records and Allison Brown and Gary West have compass records. And they said, well, when, when are you going to finish this album so we can put it out? And it was like, what? So we had to go back in the studio and rewrite some stuff. And they wrote some beautiful stuff. And we went back and finished it. And then we started doing these little tours to Colorado and stuff. And through them, I started meeting all these people in kind of a Nashville world, you know, that I didn't really know. And also my, my friend, Rob Ikes, who's an amazing dobro player. I start. I met him. I guess. I guess my career really is six degrees from a guy named Joe Craven, because Joe Joe knows. Every, and and uh, Joe called me up when I first started playing upright bass in like 1990, 91, and said, "Hey, you want to play the Davis Folk Festival with me or something?" Or it was it far even a farmers market or something? And I said, "Yeah, I don't. I didn't know him at all." He calls me and I, I drive up to Davis. We do this gig and we became instant friends. And he was, you know, David Grisman's percussionist of violin mandolinist for like twenty something years and. So he knew everybody. And so he just started calling people up and saying, there's this bass player I met. Well, anyway, I'm, I'm playing with Mike and Daryl and we're playing at the uh, High Sierra Music Festival uh, in California. And the flat tones are supposed to be there. And I'm terrified because, you know, Victor Wooten's going to be there. I've never met him. And I'm like, oh, oh, my God. And it's funny because all these guys became dear friends after this, you know, but I was just like, you know, your nervous wreck, you know, thinking, oh, and I get this tap on the shoulder and I turn around and it's Vic. And he goes, hey, man, my name's Victor Wooten. And uh, I just wanted to come up and say, hi, I've got your guys' record in my car and I've been listening to it for one. I love your bass playing, man. I just wanted to hand you my new record and just say it was really honored to meet you. And I was stunned. I was just like, who is this guy? <laughs> and then me and Billy Rich, another bass group, music bass player, sat on the side of the stage and watched their thing. And then we played and then we just kept in touch. And then um, Rob, I started saying, hey, man, you should come check out Nashville because he was from uh, Burlingame. And I said, really, Nashville? He goes, huh. And then I asked Vic and Bela Fleck, I said, well, what do you think about me moving to Nashville? And Victor goes, they both were like, yeah, I think, I think that would be a great idea. And I was like, wow, I'd never been to Nashville. You know, I've been to the South a little bit in my travels. But and uh, I was thinking I was going to go to L.A. I, I did the pilot episodes for the Magic Johnson show with Sheila E. for a week. And I thought, well, I'm going to go down there, you know. But then we went to Nat. I went to Nashville for a week during the NAM show and uh, just started bumping into people I hadn't seen in years that I didn't even know lived there. I was like, you live here now? And then, yeah, it's great. You know, and, you know, and, you know, you move to a scene. It's kind of interesting. You, you, you've experienced this. You've relocated to a new place. You know, you, you start over. Right. I mean, I was 30 years old. But I, I kind of and, and I love the Bay Area. I love the musicians I was playing with. I was playing with just these amazing artists. But I just kind of thought, man, there, you know, you, after a while, you wonder, is there something else? Is there another, you know, I grew up there. I was born and raised in that area, Vallejo, California, right? You know, and it was like, what else is going to happen, you know? And so I, I came back and, and Vic was in town. Everybody seemed to be in town. So that that NAM show. So I saw everybody and hung out and uh, I came home and told my wife, I said, hey, you know, it's pretty cool. Maybe maybe we should think about maybe in a year or two, maybe going over there, you know? 
And Julie looks at me and goes, we should do it right now because if we don't, if we think about it, we'll never do it. Which terrified me, right? So we sold our house in one day, literally. This is nine, end of the 90s when the housing market was just starting to just you know, go crazy. And um, uh, some friends of ours came and looked at it, put it in an offer the next day. And we accepted because we knew them. And now we have to find a place to live. And, you know, it's just like, ah, you know, so we went down there, found an apartment. <laughs> and then we just moved out. I knew two people and we just uprooted and planted ourselves in Nashville. And uh, it was it was shocking. You know, I mean, it's, it's I mean, as, as you know, you move yourself somewhere else. You've got to re- you got to assimilate. You know, it's not like I, I was students will say, you know, I want to break into a scene. And I said, you never break into a scene. You're invited in. You do the homework, you practice your butt off so that when the opportunity arises, you're ready. You know, you, you, you don't, you don't, you don't just break in and look at me and check me out because you're a jerk if you do that. And everyone's going to be like, I don't want to, this person's a great player, but uh, I don't want to hang out with them. This is a, you know, that kind of thing. So, so I just kind of, you know, it was, it was, it was a really daunting at first, you know, just, just trying to traverse this culture, you know, and, and, and learning that my culture, although it's a wonderful culture of the Bay area, it doesn't fit there. And if you try to be that you're, you've got a whole group of people that aren't going to be that. So kind of got to find who you are. And it was, it was very challenging, you know, um, but it, it led me to meet, you know, Jeff Coffin and uh, through that playing in his band, that's how uh, Chris Thiele used to sit in with us when because he moved to Nashville around the same time I did. And then one day Chris says, hey, man, you want to be in my band? And I said, yeah, what's your band? He goes, Nickel Creek. And I went, oh, what do you guys do? I had no I didn't really know. You know, I didn't know I'd met him, but I wasn't really familiar. And then uh, they came over to the house and we played some tunes. And that's how that happened. You know, and that, that was like 18 months. I think I played with them. And then uh, that that ended. And then um, Jerry Douglas calls me, you know, because I met Jerry through I, I met Jerry backstage. He was without we did a duo with Allison Krause and Union Station and in Texas at some rodeo thing it was a big, big, big concert thing for this rodeo thing. It was a beautiful concert. And Jerry said when he was leaving, he goes, I'm going to be calling you one day, man. I'm going to be calling you. So when the Nickel Creek gig ended, I kind of remembered that. So I kind of had his phone. I had his phone number. I called him and I said, hey, Jerry, just left him a message. It's Derek Jones, man. And don't know if you remember me, but uh, I'm not with Nickel Creek anymore. And and um, just remember our conversation. Just wanted you know. And then like a month went by and I never heard from him. And I remember I was driving in my car going somewhere and the phone rings. I'm like, hey, he goes. Hey, Derek, it's Jerry. And I'm, I'm trying to think who Jerry is because I'm like, you know, which Jerry, you know, and then it dawns on me. It's Jerry Douglas. He goes, why don't you come over to the house, man? And, you know, and, and so I went drove over to his house and we played and I did that for two years. You know, it's just like, you know, so I, I'm really fortunate. Well, I'm extremely fortunate regardless of anything because uh, I, I live in a house and play music. <laughs> my, my goal, my goal when I started all this at 15 years old, when I started gigging at 50 i was like well if i can play with the best musicians i can and have a nice enough car to live in and have a place to park it and 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 can eat i'm good i've made it <laughs> you know, i'm gonna i'm gonna be fine if i if i have a uh, if i can fit my gear in my car and i can find a safe place to park it and i can play with the best musicians and and sort of eat that's pretty much probably what I thought my, the height of my career was going to be was that. (laughs) And, and, uh, but, but playing with Rob Ikes and Jerry Douglas, two of the greatest Dobro players that have ever lived and record with them. And, you know, that was, that was, that was great. And then that led to Cirque du Soleil because uh, they came to Nashville to audition artists. So they had a, uh, they had an ad in what's called the Nashville scene, which is kind of like the Las Vegas we, pink section in the Chronicle. You know, it's, it's, it's an entertainment, what's going on in town kind of thing. And bottom one of the pages says Cirque du Soleil coming to audition artists of any kind. If you're interested, email us. And my wife and I had seen, they had a Bravo day of Cirque du Soleil stuff. I won the first Christmas we were there. And so we ended up watching that. Because we were like fascinated. It was beautiful. And I thought, man, what a beautiful company. This stuff they're doing is so great. Alegria specifically 
that was the culmination of music and art and everything to me. For me, it really grabbed me. The music was great. Uh, Dave Peltier's fretless bass playing was just beautiful. And, you know, he and he lives here now. He plays on Mystere. And so I got to thank him and go, hey, man, because of your playing, I got really interested in this company. And, you know, so it was really beautiful. And and he's a wonderful cat. And um, so when I, I remembered those Bravo shows, I'm like, oh, well, you yeah, know, it doesn't hurt to email him. And uh, so they emailed me back, said we're going to do these auditions uh, in, in August, August 4th, actually, at SIR Studios in Nashville. Can you be here at blah, blah, blah time? So yeah, I showed up and, and um, yeah, the, the audition process was way different than it is now because now they have a whole YouTube site where you can upload videos and it's real easy, man. It's like, you know, you can get the charts and play along. They send you the tracks, you play along with them, upload them to their play and then they evaluate you there and then you know you kind of go through the steps much easier but this this is when they were still going and they still go around the world checking out stuff but this was this was their first i think and only time they've gone to nashville but um i showed up with all my instruments and then it, there was no music nothing it was just make it up as you go you know i i pulled out my upright started warming up and they were like wait wait wait, don't start yet we, we don't have the cameras on and then they put down three cameras and three people and then the sound guy from nashville and and I'm just warming up. Oh, well, what piece is this? And I, I, it's not, I just, I'm just warming up. I don't know. I just, I just make, you know, oh, wow, really? You know, so then they started off with, uh, okay, we're going to play a piece of music for you. And then you're going to hear it once and then you're going to come up with a baseline for it. So they play me the piece of music and they said, you're ready. And I went, yeah. And then they play it again and I play along with it. Great. Now we're going to play you the baseline once you play it back to us. Wow. Okay. Got it. And play it back to him, you know? So there was no, it was all hearing and listening, right? Listening. And then it just went on and on different things. And, and I said, well, wait, I got another idea. Play it again. And I'd come up with a different, grab a different bass, grab a pick and start playing different things, you know? And they were like, wow, this is great. And I, and I started noticing that they're really looking for somebody with a lot of different concepts, maybe like give them different sounds and be real open. So it was just a great first hour of the audition where, where we just were laughing and having fun and playing ideas back and forth to each other. And then I, I was done with that. And, um, then I started to put my instruments away. And then one of the, uh, people from Cirque, uh, Anne Marie Duchesne says, well, Derek, that was the instrumental part of the audition. And now we're going to have you sing and dance and act. And we know you're not a singer or a dancer or an actor, but we just want to see what you can do. And I knew exactly what they were doing. I realized at that moment, this is where most musicians tank the audition because they say, oh, I don't do that. Right. And I just allowed them into my world and they came in totally willingly. I played my stuff. They allowed me to play my stuff. They allowed me to take their music and do different things with it for an hour. And they were like really open and completely clean slates and just allowing me to bring my ideas to the table. Now they're going to bring their ideas to the table and they have to see if I trust them enough to bring me into their world. And I went, OK, let's do it. They said, really? Yeah, let's do it. OK, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to dance. We're going to put on some music and you just move your body. We don't care. Just move around. And then when you're done, freeze and hold a pose and we'll turn the music off. <laughs> OK. And now remember, three cameras on you. <laughs> the Nashville set, the Nashville SIR guys smiling, but really like, OK, what is he going to do? So the music came on and it was, seems like it was something from West Africa or somewhere in that region. And my first thought was my wife and I had gone to Zellerbach Hall at UC Berkeley to see Salif Keita. And I said, what is his background singer? What did they do when they weren't singing? And then I jumped up in the air and just started going crazy. I don't know what I did. And they, the three of them behind the table with their heads went back. They're like, whoa. And I just moved around the stage, man. I was just, you know, just letting the music take me. I was just like, I don't know. I'm not a dancer, but I just kind of moved and, uh, you know, the whole thing. And then I mistakenly held a pose on one foot and realized I was on one foot and had to keep my balance. And I was just praying, please turn off the music. I do not want to fall. And then the music came off and they just busted up laughing and were clapping and they were really into it, you know. And then they had me walk across the stage three times and then stop at the microphone in the center of the stage, look into the camera and say who I was, what I did and why I wanted to work for Cirque. And I'm like, 
<laughs> Hi, my name is Derek Jones. I play bass and I'm totally out of breath because, you know, and now it turns out now when I've talked to friends of mine up in Montreal, that's the first thing you see on the video because <laughs> they've edited it to be it's really funny. I still have yet 12 and a half years trying to get a copy of this video, still have not got a copy yet. But so then we did some other thing where they said, okay, sing, just, just sing, go ahead. So I was listening to Eva Lean's on the way in. So I just kind of went and just sang something with Partido Alto Group. It just said, like, whatever came in my head, you know, it just kind of sang. And then there was a couple of other interview type questions. And then the magic thing was at the end, they said, okay, we're going to put the camera right on your face and you're to describe the words that we say with just your facial expressions. Right. It's the craziest audition ever. Right. So, so I just, they start, you ready? And then, and then there's really no time to think, right. Cause they really don't want you to think, right. They just want you to go. So yeah. And they start saying like, you know, Paris, lemons, broccoli, garbage, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever word they can. And I'm just moving my face and they're like cracking up. I don't know what I'm doing. I can't see what I'm doing. There's just a camera about this close to my face, <laughs> just like, you know, a half a foot away or something. And I'm just looking at the camera, just, you know, moving my face around. And then finally they said, well, show us Derek Jones. So I just looked at the camera and they said, show us the opposite of Derek. Jones and I turned around and showed him the back of my head and walked away because I had no ideas left. <laughs> so, but it's really interesting, man. How again preparation? What did Abe Boreal Senior just? I saw an interview with him, and he said, uh, uh, "Who wrote the Pink Panther theme?" And all those great. Oh, Henry Mancini. Henry, thank you. Henry Mancini told him, "It's music. You know, being a musician and, and being a professional musician is one percent luck." and 99% preparation and how sad it is when you finally get the shot, the 1% shot, you haven't prepared enough. That's when it's really like, oh man, you know? So I don't know how you can prepare for something like that. I mean, and again, the circuit auditions are really different now. You get charts and, you know, the whole thing. But at that moment, it was just really, you know, I kind of told myself, well, you can only be yourself at this point. You know, so, you know, you can do that <laughs> good or bad. You're going to be who you are. Don't try and figure it out. Just go in there and just be, you know, and, and, and do what you and do your best. You know, you can't do you can't be perfect. No one can. And it turned out three months later. Are you available for a show opening tomorrow in Las Vegas? I was like, no, no, you're kidding. Right. And they were like, no, was, you know, and uh that's a short story is, you know, of, I got the gig and then I was, boom, I was driving to Las Vegas and, you know, kind of ended up here, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What at, at that audition? So you had, you had no idea that that audition would be that and oh, singing no, no. and dancing. So, I mean, that's just, that's such a, I, I, it's like, might be my favorite story I've ever heard in all these hundreds of podcast interviews. Oh, I mean, wow. It's just like, it's so, so like, are, were you always a guy that was like willing to take a chance or willing to put yourself out there? Because I mean, it just says something about somebody like, like you said, I think, I, I think I can't imagine what my reaction would be if I had just finished playing my bass, you know, which already what they asked you to do musically, you know, like it's all by ear, all very, you know, but, and then, okay, well now we want you to sing and dance. And have you always kind of had that chance taking, putting yourself out there kind of personality? Well, I think um, for me, um, well, first off, I knew about the company, right? Yeah. So if you've seen any of Cirque stuff and the creativity of it and, and the massive amount of acrobatics and, 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 and the, the beautiful artistry of it all, you kind of get a vibe that this is not your norm. You know, it's not going to be a normal audition. I mean, I, I, I you know, you, but you, I didn't know what was coming. You know, that, that whole second hour was totally a surprise. But that's why when my head I clicked, I went, OK, this is what they're doing They're You know, they're inviting me into their world. They're going to see if I trust them. But I think trust, man, trust is crucial in life. And trust comes from love. Right. So it first starts with with kind of getting to know who we are and loving ourselves. And that's a hard thing. I mean, I'm almost 48 years old next week and I'm just feel like I'm scratching the surface on what that means to, to be comfortable with who I am and to love who I am and those around me 
in the same way, you know, just kind of, you know, but I, I've learned over the years. And when I was younger, it was a lot of fear, right? It was like, you know, like, like, you know, like I said, I had very low expectations living in my car. I just, I just, you know, cause you have everybody, not my parents, but my parents have always been supportive of me. And they were always like, here's an instrument. Okay. You're going to play. And they always knew where I was on Friday and Saturday night, man. I, in high school, I was not partying. I was in my room shedding, you know, cause I, I was playing, my first gig was with this uh, band called the Generation Gap Big Band in Vallejo, which is still going and started in World War II. Uh, because when the Naval Shipyard was really hitting in World War II, there was a gig every night. And some of these guys had played with Stan Kenton or Tommy Dorsey or, you know, Duke Ellington, something, you know, just different. It just was different people, you know, throughout the years that it, and they'd all moved to Vallejo because there was so much work because the, the shipyard was just pumping and there was dances halls open all over town. And, and then when the war ended and things kind of calmed down, they kind of kept the band going called the generation gap to bring the younger kids up. And I was, I was a guitar. I mean, I, I started playing guitar when I was 14, 13 and a half, 14. I, I tried playing clarinet when I was maybe in the fourth or third grade, and that lasted about maybe five weeks. But I didn't have a I didn't have a teacher, right? So I didn't, you know, you're kind of sitting there trying to figure out in your third, fourth grade, and just you know, I couldn't get a scale out for the first week, and it's so painful that those first squeaks that you're just trying to get out, you know, and everybody's being really nice, but you know, it just sounds horrible. And then I tried guitar for a while, and 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 and. Uh, what I I tried cello for a minute, but that that turned out to be another story. But it didn't it didn't work out. And then I had this guitar, and then I I, I got frustrated with the whole music thing. I, there was a some bad stuff that happened, and I was like, okay, I'm never going to play music again. I was just like, forget it. And so like maybe three years went by, and the guitar just sat in the closet. And so I kind of picked it up one day and got a penny for a pick and started playing along with my parents' records and finding melodies. And my mom came home from work and I played a song for it. She was like, how'd you do that? I said, I don't know. It's, it's easy, right? <laughs> You're just a kid. You don't know. You know. It's like, oh, I just heard it, right? You know? So I was, you know, I was using my ears even then. But the, the, the Generation Gap Big Band, I didn't plan on doing that. I, I, you know, honestly, I was into like Iron Maiden and, and Ozzy and, and I was really into Rush and, and all these Canadian bands like Saga and Marillion. It's just like, I was really into that stuff, right? You know, and Genesis. And I was just trying to figure out what the guitar players did. And, you know, so I was in the 10th grade. I just started jazz band and I, and I went to, I was taking a typing class and, and I guess the fearlessness comes from you just, you just think to yourself, well, what's the worst that can happen? <laughs> it's like, okay. It's still terrifying. No matter, it's going to be terrifying whether you do it or not. But in my mind, it was always like, well, I'd rather do it and then fail, you know, than not do it and go, gee, I wonder what would have happened. So I was taking a typing class, but I had not taken a year in typing and they put me in typing too. And I was way out of my league, man. People were flying and I was just looking around and go, oh. and there happened to be a jazz band uh, class open. And I was like, well, I don't read music and I don't really know anything about this. Well, well why don't you go to the audition and they had two guitar players in the class that basically closed their eyes and just soloed over everybody when they would play drove everybody crazy and i thought and i watched them well i could at least do that i could do i could i could at least not do that is because i was watching everybody's reactions to it i could at least stay out of the way so i got the gig and through that the drummer said hey i've got this band that rehearses on monday nights at the moose lodge called generation gap and and so i show up in my Levi's jacket, and my long hair, and my Gibson SG guitar, and I, I can barely lift my amp at the time. And I, like, and I walk in, and the band looks at me, and they just shake their heads, like, "Oh God, you know, who's this kid?" You know. But I had two things going for me, well, three things going for me. I had Mrs. Hibbard, who was the piano player, and she was, I was, her sons were in the band, and she was very adamant about me getting this gig. The guitar player's wife wanted to play bingo on Monday nights, so he couldn't go to the rehearsals anymore, and he was retired, you know. He was a wonderful guy. He sounds like Chet Atkins. It was like crazy, you know, and I thought, wow, this guy, how am I going to even, you know, um, but I sat down and I had seen a documentary on, on um, Count Basie Orchestra and Freddie Green the day before. And I watched it on PBS and I said, oh, he plays quarter notes. That's all he did. It just grew. So I went, OK, that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to do that. I'm just going to read these chord charts and I'm going to play quarter. Note. And uh, the leader of the band, Russ Kano, the co-leader of the band, was legally blind. So he couldn't really he couldn't see what I looked like. And so I sat down and I played and then the trumpet player, lead trumpet player, Mr. Tommy Tucker, looked over at me and said, 
I know you, I know your parents, blah, blah, blah. You know, and I went, yes, sir. And he goes, oh, he's a good kid. And then I was in with the trumpet section, <laughs> <laughs> which made the trombone section a little, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, and I got in on the gig. And so every Monday night we were playing in the Moose Lodge with like 50 people dancing. And it was like a thing, man. And I was like, wow. You know, and I was like, well, I was kind of wanting to be in a rock band and be cool, but I'm getting paid. <laughs> so we do senior dances. I made twenty five dollars. My mom said, now you're a professional. I was like, I'm quitting school. She was no, no, you're not. You know, <laughs> but I got my little checks and I had my little little tuxedos. And, you know, we that's what I was doing. I was playing senior dances and I learned I learned on the gig. Don't practice on the gig. Right. Because I we would finish the song and I'd start practicing the idea I had in my head. And finally, the whole trombone bone section stood up in the middle of a a show and yelled at me to shut up. Ah, really? <laughs> yeah. It echoed through the entire, we were at some gymnasium at a senior dance in Walnut Creek or Concord and it echoed, it echoed for like, in my mind, five years. Right. <laughs> and I just felt like five spotlights were on me. And I remember I learned don't practice on the gig. Okay. So, you know, but those, those fearless things, you know, it's like, it's like me going into Los Kimbos auditions. I just wanted to meet Orestes because Orestes played with Cachao. And Santana. When I was a guitar player, I was totally into Santana. And because of that, I heard Raul Ricao and I heard all these guys and Orestes and uh, Armando Paraza and just, you know, Tom Coster, all these great musicians. And I was like, man, if I could one day be around these guys for a second, you know, just to, wow, be in their presence. So my friend Ben Hever, a wonderful pianist in the Bay Area, we were teaching at the same school, music school up in Vacaville. And he goes, hey, man, you like Latin music? And I said, yeah, but I, I only know really Santana. I'm not really versed in all the other stuff. He goes, well, why don't you come to my house, man? I got a, a percussionist of mine. We'll, we'll show you the Cuban stuff. and Burgundy. So we spent a month or so every week or two times a week, I'd just go to the house and we'd play Los Van Van and Typica 73. And he'd have all these charts and he'd discuss clave and how the tumbao worked and, and how the bass part fit with the piano part, which fit with the percussion, part, you know, everything, the horn part, how everything was, was wrapping around each other. And I, you know, I came from a, a more of a rock and, and then I was, I was a jazz studies major in college. So, you know, I, I played bass, but I didn't really understand the role of it that deeply as I, as this taught me, you know, I mean, if I didn't play this part, it, the whole thing fell apart. So it was like, Oh God. Okay. So I really, kind of got into that. And then it made me think about my walking baseline patterns, or if I was playing on a blues gig, what's the importance of what I'm doing? Instead of, I can't wait for my solo, right? <laughs> it's like, when you're oh man, I can't wait to burn over these changes. <laughs> Ugh, you know, and, and all of a sudden I was like, I, you know, I can't burn on these chains. I have to lay this down or go home. So then Ben says to me one day, Hey man, Los Kimbos is auditioning bass players. You want to audition? And I thought, no, but yes, I have to. I mean, I was terrified, right? I mean, that, that, that's, you know, there's like 10 guys that were just killing going to audition for that. I mean, that was the, that was the gig because they worked like 20 times a month, man. I mean, it was like back then the salsa clubs were like all over the Bay Area. But I thought if I could just meet Orestes, right, if I could just meet him, I could get it. If I get his phone number, I can get a lesson with him. That would change my life, right? That's all I want. And, you know, I, I don't need much. I just need that moment with him to ask him certain questions. You know, it was kind of like when I met Kai Eckhart, you know, the, the legendary bass player. Right. And I heard that live at the Royal, Royal Festival Hall or some album, the trio album that came out in blue and green. And I was like, who is this guy? And then I'm at a I'm at a jam session to Benicia, California. And I overheard the drum going, yeah, I hung out with Kai Eckhart last night. I was like beeline over there. What did you say? And. And he says, oh, yeah, man, he's moved to town. He's getting married. And, and I said, do you have his phone number? And he goes, yeah. And I went, oh, my God, you got to be kidding me. So I got his number. And the next morning I waited till like 10, 1030. And I was shaking as I dialed the number, man, because I thought this guy's going to get away from me, kid. You know, so I, and I called him up and I said, Mr. Kai Eckhart? He goes, yeah. I said, my name's Derek Jones. I was wondering if you taught lessons. He said, sure, you want to come over? And I was like. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's taking those chances, man. I mean, for me, those were chances for me because I thought, oh, they're just going to blow me off. And, you know, or, or, you know, I always, I guess I always thought people were meaner than they actually are. You know, I was always kind of like, oh, you know, what are they going to do? And um, so I, 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 they sent back to Lil Skimba, but I ended up meeting, meeting Kai and having a lesson with him. And then we ended up having a band for a while, two basses and drums. And we did homeless shelter gigs in Berkeley. And I, he became one of my dearest friends and one of my favorite human beings on the planet, you know, and of course learned so much from him. Uh, but 
then when I, the, so they sent the Los Kimbo, Los Kimbo sent me three charts to learn. So I kind of learned them. And then I was the last guy to audition because get, who is this guy? So I get there and um, I, I meet Ben at San Francisco State University where they were rehearsing. And then uh, Orestes walks in with his gear and I couldn't believe it, man. I was just like, uh, 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 oh my God, it's, it, it, it's him in the flesh, you know? <laughs> and Ben goes, hey, Ori, man, this is Derek Jones. He's a young bass player. He's going to audition. And he looks me up and down. And he looks at Ben, like, who's this kid? Nobody knows who he is. You know, I'm like 21, 22 years old. And he kind of puts his fingers together about maybe four inches apart and goes, well, some people know salsa. And then he widens his arms all the way right. And some people know salsa. And I took my thumb and index finger and put them as close together as I could. I said, I'm about right here, sir. But I am so thankful I'm just standing in front of you. And I can't believe I'm meeting you. You know, and he goes, and he laughs and shakes my hand and goes in. And then Ben goes, here's the deal, man. Orestes doesn't play around. So if he gives you the evil eye, you're done. And I said, man, I will get the evil eye in three notes. If I can get his phone number afterwards, that's all I'm here for, right? Now, I did my homework. I didn't just like, you know, show. I, I shedded that stuff. Man. I was yeah, like, yeah, you know, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm a, if anything, I'm going to know these songs. You know, and these, the band's been auditioning bass players and, you know, they all have the guy that they want, you know. And so when I come in, they're just done, right? They're like, ah, tired and want to go home. And I understand. So I'm just like, OK, this will be quick because they're just going to stop me. And that's fine. So we start the first song and I'm playing and all the rest is just looking. I'm just got, I've got my eye on him, the corner of my eye on him and on the chart. I'm looking back and forth and he's looking at me and he's kind of giving me this look like, huh? <laughs> and I'm like, is that the evil eye? <laughs> and then we get about, you know, almost down the first page of the chart. And I start thinking to myself, what a nice guy. He's going to let me finish a tune. How cool is that? He's not going to embarrass me. You know, he's going to let me finish the tune. And he's going to go, nice try, son. You know, it's a, well, that's really cool. Cause I've heard he just like, no, stop, no, out. You know, we finished the first tune. All right. He goes next tune. And I go, wow. And then the band's kind of looking at each other. What's going on? And my friend Ben's looking at me like, wow. You know, like everyone's kind of, okay. So we do the next tune and, and Oresta starts kind of grooving and moving his body. And now he starts to play a little more and it starts to terrify me because the power coming off of him is just like, Oh my God. And I'm looking over at him. He's kind of looking at me and kind of smiling. And I'm like, what a nice guy. He's going to let me play through another yeah. tune. I mean, <laughs> well, I totally suck at this, you know, and he's totally like, you know, and I'm all I can think in my head is like, I totally suck. And you know, it's all in my mind. I, I, what a nice guy. And then we get to the third tune and in the middle of it, he starts taking a solo. And now I'm holding on for dear life, man. I'm just like looking at him. Just I, I'm I'm almost tearing up because I just can't believe this is happening. And he's just grooving and looking at me and I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, what again, what a nice guy, man. This is you know, I've got everything I've ever wanted in life. Right yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like, this is all I've ever wanted. <laughs> and then we finish and then they pull out a chart for me to sight read. And I, I get through it. OK, you know, and, and, and try to. I'm kind of like my brain is spinning because I can't believe I've gotten this far. You know, I'm just like, wow, fourth song, you know, with this, with the greatest band I can imagine, you know. And uh, then we're done. And uh, the whole band just kind of looks around at each other. And I figure this is my last chance. So I rush up to Orestes and I go, sir. And I shake his hand. Thank you so much for this opportunity. If, if I could get your phone number, I'd love to get a lesson from you. If, if you have the time one day, I mean, you know, whatever it takes, I'll, I'll do whatever, you know, I'll show up any time, you know, I'll clean your house. You know? So, <laughs> you know. And he goes, we'll talk about that later. Don't leave. And I said, well, I have to go to the bathroom. So, okay, go to the bathroom and come back. And I run out to the bathroom and I'm just like freaking out because I'm like, okay, go to the bathroom. You don't want to come back and they're gone, you know, and, Go on. I'm sitting there in this, <laughs> this urinal, man, it's hilarious. And the musical director, Julius Melendez, comes up to the one next to me. And he's almost like, I can't believe I'm saying this. I look at his face and says, oh, that's just loved you, man. If you want the gig, it's yours. Whoa. I would have peed my pants. <laughs> I, would have, I would have lost, you know, I was terrified because I was not ready. That's the other thing, man. You're never ready, right? You can prepare and do all this stuff, but you're never really ready until you experience that. So there's a there's a point where as musicians, we can shed and shed and shed in our room. And that's really great. But music is to be shared and played with others. You know, I don't care how many YouTube channels or whatever you have of these guys soloing and doing all this great stuff. You put them in a room with another musician. How do you listen to them? You know, music is a conversation, right? And it should be maybe, you know, another teacher, the great Mel Graves, who I studied up right with at Sonoma State, 
told me, he said, it's 10% your ideas and 90% everyone else's. And it's your reaction to what they're saying. And if everybody listens like that, then the music can do what it wants. Because the music tells us what it wants, right? I mean, you can listen to Bach, you can listen to Frank Zappa, you can listen to anything, any type of music when you hear it, if it touches you in any way, it's also telling you what it wants and what it is and who you are, right? Because it's, it's resonating in you and you're getting to know yourself. Well, why does that, why does that make my, make, give me goosebumps, you know? And, and why does that not? And then later on, oh, it did. Like I didn't get it before. And now I hear it again. I have more uh, um, experience and more maturity. And all of a sudden I hear the same piece of music that I didn't get the first time. Now it's like blowing my mind. I'm like, this is the greatest thing ever. It's because humanity is made to support each other and to listen to each other and to learn from each other. And music is one of those I was talking with a friend of mine about it. It's 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 one of the only hopes that we have. It, it's so hopeful because whether you speak the same language, you can listen to a piece of music together and smile. You can play together if you don't speak our language. You speak music. You can you know. And and I think the the thing that made me want to be a musician and made me want to be fearless was the fact that I it was the only avenue that I thought I had to meet so many different people and to share their cultures. You know, you can do three things. You can learn their language, you can eat their food, and then you learn their art, right? You, you, you know, and I didn't know, I didn't have the opportunities to study different languages. I will eat the food, but being able to be on stage or in a room with, with different people and, exp and listen to them and they listen to you, it's that vulnerability too, man. You can't really play music unless your heart's on your sleeve. You can't guard yourself and then share yourself. You know, and I think that's the when, when you ask me, how do you have that fearlessness? Well, if I guard myself. That I don't you know, that wall goes both ways. It doesn't allow things in, but it doesn't allow me out either. And I took me a while to learn that, man. I was pretty guarded. I was kind of like, you know, put my instrument on and I know what to do. Put it away. I don't know who I am. Right. And I almost became a shield. The bass became like a shield. It became a, a competition, which was horrible. It became a, uh, a gauge of my self-worth. Like if, if I had a really good gig, oh, I'm really great. If I had a bad gig, oh, I'm a horrible person. Right. And it's all that stuff that we we, we put pressures on ourselves. We work so hard and your career is never going to end up how you thought it was going to. I've never met anybody say, you know, I did this, this, and this, and that's what happened. You know, you just kind of go and take a step and then another step. And then the universe opens up as you're, as you're stepping and, and, you know, you end up where you end up and you just keep working at it. You know, I mean, it's uh, so that fearlessness, you know, most of the musicians that I admired had that. I mean, you listen to them, they have a thing. They have a, it's, it's not, I mean, we're all unique. It's just that they allow them themselves to come out, you know, in an orchestra, you can hear an orchestra and know that's that orchestra. You feel the energy that they have or that group of people, you know, it doesn't necessarily, you have to know everybody's name, but because they've worked together so long and they know each other so well, that music has a thing because of them, not because of the music, because of them playing it. And I think that's where the, you know, again, for me, I wanted to be around people like that because I admired that. You know, I mean, when I was in a band called Grease Factor, which was Jeff Sype was Aquarium Rescue Unit's drummer and Count Boots, who was Percussion Aquarium Rescue Unit, Shane Terrio on guitar, who's now the MD for Daryl uh, Hall and Oates, and then uh, Johnny Neal, amazing organist and keyboardist and singer from Nashville, play with the Allen Brothers, Blind Cat, man, will literally, I've had a bit on stage with him and he will look at me right in my eye. And I was stunned. And James was like, yeah, isn't that trip how he does that? You know, I'll be standing next to him with a group and also he just turns his head and looks right at my eye. And I'm like, wow. And I, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't see it all. And we started that band. We had no rehearsal. Jeff said, hey, I've got this idea and uh, we're going to make up everything go on stage and make it all up lyrics, everything. Are you in? And, and you know, just one of my favorite drummers and favorite people in the world. I said, yeah, man, if you're playing, I'm in, let's just try. I mean, and talk about terrifying. We were actually going to get together and have a rehearsal. And we were in that Shane and, and, and Johnny and I were in Nashville and the rest of the guys were in North Carolina and there was an ice storm. So we couldn't drive out the first day. So we literally had to drive out the day of the gig. We got on stage 
I remember Derek Trucks Band was there because they heard about it and they all wanted to see what was going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so they were there. So I was like, oh man, they're like, okay, man, we better not fall on our butts. And we got our stuff on stage at this little joint in, in uh, Asheville, North Carolina. And then boom, just started playing. And then two hours went by. And then the next day we played in Greensboro, North Carolina, at a place called the Handlebars, the Handlebar Mustache, that's why I remember it. And this, and we took a break and this guy came up to us and said, how long have you guys been together? And Shane goes, a day. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy looked at us like, no, no, seriously. And I said, yeah, man, we actually started playing together yesterday. I didn't know Johnny or Shane. I met him in the van. And then we drove, we got to know each other driving to North Carolina. It's like a seven hour drive from Nashville. And then we got on stage and started playing. But it was all about that listening, right? And it was all about taking a chance. And I learned a lot. I love those guys. And, and you know, they were all fantastic at what they did, but they were all really open and giving with what they did. And each one of those guys is just a beautiful human being. So there was never, I didn't really feel in danger because what's the worst that can happen, right? What's the worst that can happen, man? If you make a mistake, I mean, yeah, you know, there's certain things where you have to be on your A game, but no one's going to die. You know, no one's going to get hurt. You're going to maybe, you know, people audition for gigs and maybe you don't get that audition. Maybe that day it was out. Maybe you do get that audition the next day. I don't know. You know, I mean, or you meet somebody and you're on a gig and they give your name to somebody and the phone rings. I mean, who knows? You know, you just again, you just kind of it's all about being a human being and 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 being around other human beings and trying to support those other people. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's such a great sentiment. I, I love the way you put it. And your, your career is such a, a, a great example of somebody like you never in a million years would have guessed like, 20 years ago what you're doing now right i mean it's but and i think that that's just such it's such a great example just seeing like taking the opportunities that become available working hard taking a risk and like you said like what's the worst that can happen you know i like to i like to say like the worst that can happen with most of what i do is like that people will be bored you know, <laughs> you know like yeah yeah and and you know it's funny um i was playing on the tonight show with nickel creek and my friend vicky randall was a percussionist singer on that show for many years and she's one of my heroes man just an amazing musician and she comes running up to me out of the out of the dresser she's getting her makeup done and she, she i looked in the camera at you guys' sound check and went one of these things is not like the other <laughs> and she's like you were like the salsa latin straight ahead all times of music and now you're in a bluegrass band and that, like where did this happen I, said, I don't know i just you know it was always great musicians you know the thing i loved about nickel creek and i learned so much for there, there, there was an audience looking for great music not a light show, not all that stuff. There's actually people out there that just want to hear four people with microphones sing and play. And that was all, you know, there was no light, there was no other thing. You know, we had a sound guy, that was it. You know, it was just, and that to me, you know, it, 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 I just wanted to be around, and I still just want to be around great musicians, you know, and, and play, gr play great music and, and be inspired by that, you know, whether it be meeting Gary Carr or, you know, my time in Nashville with, you know, Jerry or Rob or Victor, or, you know, playing with my friend, the great bassoonist, Paul Hansen, who's like my best friend in the whole world and all the stuff I learned and still continue to learn from him. Just every, I mean, there's so many people that have given me a shot, you know, and, and I worked my butt off to be able to supply what they needed and, and be there without too much, without any hassles. Right. You know, just show up on time, have your stuff together, be really nice leave with everybody smiling and do it again every day. You know, it's like, uh, and I wasn't always good at that. And I'm, I'm learning. I mean, like I said, I didn't know I, this Las Vegas is the one place I told my folks I would never live. You know, I was like my dad, I think in the mid late nineties said, you know, you just think about moving to Nashville. I said, dad, if I can guarantee one thing in my life, because <laughs> <laughs> I just had the, you know, I, I'd never been to Nashville. I actually yeah. only flew through here in the airport, but I just thought, I mean, not Nashville, Las Vegas. Las Vegas yeah. uh, I, 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 I'd never been to Las Vegas. I'd played all over the country, but never here. And I just had this preconceived stereotype idea. And then when I got here, I was kind of a little bit ashamed of myself and almost, and all, and all kind of scared, like, oh my God, where am I? What is this? place really and then i found an amazing group of musicians here that you know are just killing it you know and as soon as i just started showing up i mean for the first year i didn't go out at all really i just got my family here i did my job honestly i thought the show would last maybe a couple of years you know i didn't know it'd be like five thousand two hundred performances now or something like that you know <laughs> and and it's 
and it just amazes me. And, and uh, it's, uh, but I, I started meeting musicians and going out, hanging out with guys and sitting in and, and uh, boom, boom, boom. People, you know, I started doing other stuff as well when I could. And, and uh, again, it's just, you know, I, I think, I think the hardest thing is to not give up. You know, there was a time when I gave up for a while. I just didn't want to play anymore. I was burned out, you know, and I think that's because I, I put too much pressure on it and blamed music for something that it had no idea how to, you know, music is, is, is a joy. It's not, you know, I think people get stuck with it. I got to make a living. I've got to make money. I've got to do this. We're, yeah, music's not going to, you know, there's no guarantee that music's going to do any of that, but you're the, there is no guarantees in life. But if, if you love what you do and you know, it's like what Bela Flex said to me once he said, if you can think of doing anything else, do that, you know? And like I said, we don't know where it's going to lead us, you know? And everybody talks about how it's, it's worse now than it was blah, blah, blah. Well, when we were coming up, man, people were saying that to us, Exactly. you know, that's yeah. why I thought I'd live in my car because most people said, well, let me tell you why it didn't work out for me. Right. Yeah, this mailman one day randomly said, "Yo, you're never going to make it, kid, you know, because I didn't make it. And, right. and this is what's going to happen to you. And so I just thought, well, man, I guess I shouldn't have my sights set very high, but I still want to do it. You know, I can't imagine doing anything else. So uh, I'll just live in my car. So you kind of like, you know, and then you wait for things to happen. And, and but I do tell students sometimes, you know, if, if you want to make a living and you want to put food on the table, define the food you want to have on that table, you know. You can do that. You have every right to do that. And then ask yourself, how do I get here? And also plant the seeds now that you can harvest later. You know, O'Teal Burbage just wrote this beautiful thing about Colonel Bruce Hampton. And Colonel Bruce Hampton passed away last week on his 70th birthday on stage at his 70th birthday party in the Fox Theater on the encore with 40 something of his of musicians around him in a full house. And I don't know if you know who he is. You could look him up later, Colonel Bruce Hampton, but he was a, he started the Aquarium Rescue Unit, was in the Mothers of Invention, was sage, was a mystic. I never, I didn't hang out with him many times, but the times I did, it changed my life completely. And uh, when he passed away, I called up Sype because, you know, just how, how are you? How's everything going? We had a good cry and talked. And it made me realize when O'Teal wrote in his on his website about Colonel Bruce and about how the stuff they did where they were making no money, and just playing gig after gig after gig was the seeds that they were planting for the harvest later when he like joined the Almond Brothers band or when they, they all went to different gigs and they had had all this. They were all amazing musicians and they had gone through all the fear and the stuff. And, you know, Colonel Bruce said, you know, I, I want to hear your fear when you play. I want to hear who you are. I don't want to hear all the slick stuff that you worked on in your practice room. I want to hear about your dog dying. I want to hear about the happiness you have about your parents. You know, he would just discuss this stuff at length, man. I want to hear your life on that stage. I want you to, you know, if you ain't sweating at the end of the gig, you ain't playing, right? You know, all this stuff he would say, that's all we have, right? I mean, if we're going to be musicians and we're going to do this, no, you you can't look at somebody else and go, gee, I wish I would have had their gig because they work. That's their life. You know, you just have to kind of keep hoping, you know, and, 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 and keep working at it because it's going to get better. It's, it's, you know, there's seasons, man, you know, and we, we plant seeds. I'm planting seeds now that I probably won't even see for 20 years, you know, and, you know, you just have to keep planting those seeds and those seeds are love, man. And when you can plant those seeds of love, and you show everybody love and you show love through your music and you share your music and your passion for what you do and with 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 all of us and we share it back what else is there what else is there because that's what we're called to do if that's what you're what you want to do then don't let anybody tell you that ah you know it's not like it was ah you know I saw the Spotify records just say, you know, that somebody made 1.0000595 cents to play. And, you know, and it's really sucks and you can't make a living and you can't do anything. There's no place to play, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like, well, you know, that may be your experience, but there's people out there playing and growing and doing stuff all over the world. And uh, we just have to continue to do it. And this podcast, your podcast, man, is so inspiring because I'll turn it on and listen to stuff on my way into work or my way from work or just doing things around the house. And I, everybody you, I, you interview, man, there's always at least one, if not 10 things that you can take away from it. The questions you ask, you let them talk and how you go, oh, 
That's great. That's a great idea. Oh, that's a great idea. What a great thing. What a great concept. What a great technical idea for approaching this arpeggio. What a, what a great idea for getting to the gig or setting this up. I mean, man, you know, this stuff, you, the work you do, man, is changing lives, you know, and it's just so inspiring. So to be a part of it and be here talking with you is just a goosebump moment, right? Because because it's just beautiful because because it's, it's all part of being positive, you know, because it's easy to go. Life sucks. Mm hmm. You know, right, right. my bass sucks. Right. My instruments suck. Everything <laughs> sucks. There's no gigs. Oh man, you know, it wasn't you know, blah, blah. and you know, okay, you know, but we have a two choices to make. We can either believe that or we can go, but it's going to get better. Mm -hmm. you know? Man, it's going to get better. I love it. Well, I, I, thank you for the kind words. That means so sure. much to me. I mean, sure. and, and like, and what I, I just love the, you're just so eloquently describing things that just ring so true to me. And you know, like this, I, I love one of the things I love about doing this is like, I would want to have this conversation with you anyway. You know I mean? This is like an right. awesome talk. And then there's this added benefit of sending it out to the world. And you're hearing from people in Australia in Europe and Indonesia. I get emails from people and they're like, wow, you know, so it's just so cool to have have that added benefit of having these conversations well the, the world is getting smaller because of the technology right i mean bruce the first day i met him i was in line to get food after the zambiland rehearsal with like 40 50 musicians on stage we we're all just playing and getting sounds and everything and i got a tap on the shoulder and it's called bruce i'll come around wow he was like victor woods like oh my god it's bruce hampton and he asked, hey, where are you from? Where are you playing? You know, and all this stuff. And I started talking to him and I, he started asking me who I played with. And I mentioned Sheila E., you know, as one of the people. And he goes, man, I remember hanging in a room with Miroslav Vitos and Sheila E. in 1976 talking about, you know, wind dynamics and, and music harmony and blah, blah, blah. And he goes on and, on, and I've never heard anybody put Miroslav Vitos and Sheila E. in the same <laughs> sentence, right? <laughs> and I'm like... Wow, man. And then finally he just laughs at you and he goes, man, it's a small world. And I went, man, for you, it's a really small yeah. world. But it was just that kind of thing where, you know, again, you know, loving everybody and just sharing our ideas with each other, man, it brings us all together, you know, and and, and we can do it you know, all over the world now. And, and uh, it's just an exciting time. It is. You know? It is. It's not the pale moon that excites me that thrills Derek such a pleasure can't wait to follow along with what you continue to do and folks isn't that a beautiful album those excerpts we played definitely check out run with me you can find it wherever you find music spotify itunes that sort of thing and links are in the show notes and you know people ask me a lot and I'm so thankful for this how can I help with the podcast? I've discovered this podcast, or maybe I've been listening for one, two, five, ten years, whatever. How can I help? And you know, the number one thing you can do to help is share this episode. So whether it's this episode or, or any episode, you can share it right on your phone, right on your Android phone, your iPhone. Just hit that share button, share it out to Facebook or wherever you hang out online. Go to our website, ContrabassConversations.com. Look through the last few months. Share out an episode that you like. That's the number one thing you can do to help. There are a lot of other things you can do to help for sure. And those are all listed on our website at ContrabassConversations.com slash support. But sharing is the number one thing. I'm so glad to hear from the people who write in. Feedback at ContrabassConversations.com gets you to me, or Jason at ContrabassConversations.com gets you to me too. I answer each and every email, and it's such a thrill for me to open up my inbox in the morning. I'm one of the few people that probably can say that. Now I give a bunch of spam and that kind of stuff, get that out of the way. And then what do I have? I have these beautiful messages from people all around the world, letting me know a little bit about themselves and a guest idea for the show, maybe a topic we're going to dig into. And I keep track of all of that. And that's what helps me shape who I pick to interview for the show, topics we're digging into. We're doing some cool new stuff here in June as the summer gets going. Got some topical, thematic episodes coming. I know you're really going to be excited. And this week, we're chatting with Derek Jones and we're chatting with Tom Mendel for our next episode. So we're kind of diving into the theater world this week. We talked about I 
ISB the previous week, auditioning, jazz artists. I love digging into different topics, and I'd love to hear if you have any thoughts about different topics you'd like to hear more about. So again, feedback at ContrabasedConversations.com. Go to our website, share out a favorite episode. Maybe it was this one. Man, did I have a great time talking with Derek. Thank you, thank you, thank you for listening. I'm honored and thrilled and appreciate it so much. And we will see you again very soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. 